Are injuries going to be the Atlanta Falcons' Achilles heel this season? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NFL, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Guys, if you don't know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, your very humble host. Been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcfans.com, RIP. You may also know me as my aliases, Sirius Black and Mr. Drew. My friends call me Negative Nancy, but you can call me Mr. Drew, but you can easily become one of my friends by becoming an everydayer of this illustrious podcast. And all you got to do is subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts, and you'll get the latest episode as soon as it is available. So today's episode is a Q&A episode. We'll be answering a variety of questions, talking about the Falcons' lack of depth on their offensive line, which will be a bigger conversation about the overall concerns about depth on this team. We'll talk about the wide receiver room. We'll talk about Julio Jones and where he stacks up all time. We'll talk about my musical taste as well as we'll play. uh, We'll see if we get there, but hopefully we'll be able to get enough time to play a a game where we sort of play start, bench, cut with – Vic Beasley and Jalen Mayfield, among others. But uh, we'll talk about the news where the Falcons filled their last two practice squad spots on uh, Thursday. As expected, Josh Miles was brought back to the practice squad as an extra body at that swing tackle position. They also signed ex-Panthers wide receiver C.J. Saunders, formerly of Ohio State. And what's notable about Saunders is he was with the Falcons in their 2021 mini camp. He did not sign with the Falcons, of course, uh, but did wind up signing later that summer with the Panthers. Uh, did not make the team that year, but was on the practice squad. Did get two late games uh, against the Bucks in that 2021 season. Then from what I understand, came back the next year, had a really good camp, almost made the team, but then got hurt and wound up spending another year on the practice squad. Uh, and obviously it was just cut by the Panthers this past summer. And it's worth noting about Saunders is it, it seems like him and Isaiah Prince were both part of that 2018 Ohio State uh, team. So either Urban Meyer's influence is, you know, growing on this team or maybe this is Dwayne Jones, the Falcons assistant director of college scouting. He formerly covered the Midwest when he was a scout with the Baltimore Ravens before joining the Falcons. And maybe he's just dusting off his old 2019 draft notes uh, for these two guys, which is why they brought those guys in. So we'll see what happens with them. You know, I know that JJ Ortega white side truthers are going through it right now with him not being back, to, brought back to the practice squad with CJ Saunders, but let's get into our first question of today. It comes from Corey D in the discord. He says, Hey, Aaron, based on today's episode, our swing tackle situation is not great. Do you think there is a chance Matthew Bergeron could kick over to tackle if Matthews or McGarry were to get injured during the season Our backup guards seem to be in a better spot, just better spot to start the regular season uh, than our current tackles. So in general, I'd be against the idea of, of asking Matthew Bergeron to move from left guard. I think you want to establish him as a left guard before you think about changing his positions. But I'm reminded a little bit of Andy Levitri way, way back in the day when he was with the Bills back in 2011. Uh, they had a game where he had to start left tackle. And like Bergeron, Levitri was a college left tackle before moving to guard in the NFL. And I remember him playing particularly well in that game going up against DeMarcus Ware. Um, and you know, but that was year three of Andy Levitri. He had already sort of established himself before they tinkered with that. But you could certainly imagine a dire situation where the Falcons, you know, in the case where Isaiah Prince, the Falcons expected swing tackle, this is not a shot at Isaiah Prince, but his body of work, he has not played well when he's gotten opportunities in the past. Uh, And so if that continues this year, should the situation arise, you could see a situation where the Falcons are so desperate to get their best five on the field that that does not include Isaiah Prince. And that's maybe one of those interior guys. And that would push Bergeron. I think the specific scenario that I'm imagining, which is not one I, I want to spend time imagining, but it's m- less McGarry going down. It's more Matthews going down just because like we have lived in a world where Caleb McGarry was a little iffy and we've been able to still function. We've never really lived in a world where Jake Matthews was not there. And so much of the Falcons protection involve Jake Matthews basically being on an island. And that's one of the reasons why Jake Matthews is perennially underrated 
by a lot of folks in and outside of Atlanta. But you could imagine a scenario where Jake Matthews goes down. You would bump Bergeron out the left tackle, keep Dahlman, Lindstrom, McGarry in place, and you just want to get your best five on the field. And maybe that doesn't include Perrins, and maybe that includes someone like Ryan Newsel getting the call up or Kyle Hinton getting the call up at that left guard position. Um, but this speaks to to me an issue that you've heard me talk a, a lot about the last couple of weeks, concerns about our offensive line depth, but I think it speaks to a larger concern I have about this team. And we spent, you know, the better part of the last six months talking about all the ways that, that this season could go right for this team. You know, I, I think it's fair to spend five minutes on today's episode talking about how it could go wrong. And I am concerned about this team's overall lack of depth. That in a lot of ways, this 2023 Falcons team feels a lot like the 2012 team not necessarily in terms of what I think their potential to do in the season is. I, I'm not expecting this team to be a one seed as, as optimistic as I am. Um, but, you know, that team, that 2012 team was very top heavy, right? They, they tended to rely on their top 10 to 12 players to play at a high level. And all those guys played at or near their peak levels in that season. And you saw this, that team be very successful winning 13 games, being a one seed. But then you saw the flip side of that the following year where they lost a couple of players on their offensive line they lost john abraham and then several of those key top 10 ish players sean weatherspoon asante samuel julio jones roddy white were beat up the next year and you saw a big drop off now that team dropped off to a four win total uh i don't think the drop off would be that substantial right because in part i think the 2012 team kind of overachieved and the 2013 team underachieved like if you look at their expected win totals based off of point differential that 2012 team probably was close to an 11 win team and the 2013 team was should have been a six win team, but still, that's a five point swing that isn't solely due to injuries, but injuries were a big part of it. And when I look at this year's team, you know, similarly, I think they're kind of top heavy with like I would say 11 guys that we all kind of go into the season expecting to have big years and play at, at high levels. Those would be Bijan Robinson, Drake London, Kyle Pitts, Jake Matthews, Chris Lindstrom. Brady Jarrett, David Onyemata, Calais Campbell, Caden Ellis, Jesse Bates, AJ Terrell. And, you know, a big question that we have for this year's team is like, who will join those guys? Will, will that top 11 become top 15? And will some of the young players like a Desmond Ritter, Arnold Epichetti, Richie Grant, uh, Jeff Akuda, Troy Anderson, et cetera, you know, jump into that group and, and be sort of proven reliable players? And if they do, then I think, you know, we're well on our path to the Falcons you know, reaching their goals, which is making the playoffs. And, and we'll see after that point. But, you know, we don't want to imagine this scenario, but I don't think it's that hard to imagine the scenario where, you know, some of those unproven guys don't make that leap as well as some of those more proven guys. You know, I know Bijan's not proven yet uh, at this point, but some of the guys that we're having a lot more confidence that they're going to be impact players for us. Let's say that, um, you know, they don't, they miss significant time and therefore aren't the impact players. And you see this Falcon team become a lot more ordinary in that circumstances and not reach their goals of, of being a playoff team. So I think that's a concern we have to have. And I think the way that you navigate those issues more often than not is you got to have some, some sort of bedrock that can sort of keep the team afloat, right? That foundation. And, you know, I, I know it's not fair to always compare everything to the Chiefs, but they are the best team in the league for a reason. And sort of their bedrock and their foundation is obviously Patrick Mahomes. But we've even seen when Patrick Mahomes has missed time and Chad Henney has been inserted into the lineup, you know, like that offense, again, not as good as it is with Patrick Mahomes, but still a very good offense that can keep that team going. And we'll see if that continues with Blaine Gabbert uh, this season now that Henney's retired. But, you know, I think the Falcons bedrock, their, their sort of foundation is that run game. And you can imagine a scenario talking specifically about the offensive line where if injuries impact that unit, especially some of the better players on that offensive line, does that foundation, does that bedrock start to crumble a little bit? And can this team stay afloat? And if they are, what is the other thing that st steps up? Is it the passing game? Is it the defense that can sort of keep this team competitive week in and week out and keep them winning games so that they can achieve their goal? So we don't quite know that. I wouldn't spend too much time, you know, losing any sleep over that. But if, you know, if you're up at night saying your prayers, you know, toss up a few to, uh, you know, the, the joints, ankles and, and, and bones of uh, various, you know, key players on this Falcons team, in addition to whatever you're usually praying about. So that's what I'll say. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. We'll continue today's episode talking a little bit more about the Falcons wide receiver room. Uh, talking a little bit about Josh Ali. We'll talk also about where Julio Jones ranks all time um, on today's episode, and we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. 
So the NFL season is nearly upon us, and you can get ready with the incredible offers over at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get in bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers will bet $5 will get a $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Of course, you can't take, you can't, uh, you know, miss out on such a discount for such a fine product. Uh, and this is absolutely the best time to join FanDuel if you haven't already. Their app is safe, secure, super easy to use. You get instant payouts, and you can bet on anything from point spreads, player props, whatever, whether you want to bet on the Falcons winning week one, you want to bet on B. John Robinson being offensive rookie of the year as that sort of bedrock player, whatever you want, just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer that you don't want to miss. The FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. So, guys, before we continue today's uh, q and I, I want to thank everyone once again that is an everyday here that makes this illustrious podcast their first listen. Uh, but I also want to recommend for your second listen, check out the Locked On Ultimate NFL Season Preview. The annual, you know, extravaganza is here. Seven episodes of opinions, analysis, plenty of debate from all of the Locked On NFL hosts, as well as added insights from our national experts. It's a can't miss series. Uh, before the season kicks off and you can catch every episode on locked on NFL on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. So our next question comes from cell in the discord. He asks um, quick question for serious black. How do you feel about Josh Ali making the 53 man roster and his fit in the receiver room thus far to help out the team this year? Um, I don't have strong Josh Ali takes, you know, I feel like he's very capable receiver capable of giving you similar production to what, you know, Kadero Hodge and Demir Bird did last year, sort of as your de facto three, four type of receiver, if need be. I don't think that's the expectation for Josh Lee at this point in time. But if push comes to shove, he could potentially give you similar value. You know, generally how I know Arthur Smith doesn't believe in, in wide receiver one versus wide receiver two, but, you know, the rest of the world does. Uh, but generally how I would stack wide receivers one versus two, et cetera, is Wide receiver one typically gets eight to 12 targets a game. And number two gets five to eight targets. And number three gets three to five. And number four gets one or two, right? And I would say in this offense, given, you know, this is not a shot at the offense. It's just we don't throw the ball enough to really make it normal like it is for other teams. You know, I, I would expect on a consistent basis, you can get number two production from both Kyle Pitts and Drake London. Uh, if anybody's going to give you number one production, it's probably going to be Drake Lennon just because I think he has that stronger rapport with Desmond Ritter at this point in time. We saw this in the preseason game against Cincinnati where it's like it's third and whatever. I'm going to Drake Lennon. You know, he's the guy that I trust to win. Um, you know, I think Matt Collins can give you that solid number three production, three to five targets a game. And then everybody else is probably certainly capable, including Josh Ali, of giving you, you know, that number four production, which is one or two targets a game. Now, as a noted Scotty Miller truther, um, I think he's capable of giving you a lot more than that. Uh, you know, to me, the dynamic between him and Matt Collins, and this is not a shot at Matt Collins, but is to me similar to the dynamic between Taylor Gabriel and Muhammad Sanu that like similarly, like when we saw in that back half of the 2016 season, the Falcons were kind of able to unlock the explosive playmaking potential of Taylor Gabriel. And that raised the ceiling of the offense. And I feel like if the Falcons could do something similar with Scotty Miller this year, um, it will also raise the ceiling of this offense, not in addition to the vertical stuff that he, he brings with his speed, but you can also find creative ways in not just being targets, but creative ways to get him the ball and maybe getting three to five touches a game, which includes like screens and jet sweeps and end arounds and reverses and all those various things. And while I think Matt Collins' floor in this offense is higher than Scotty Miller's because we could see Scotty Miller going by the wayside, similar to what we saw with Brian Edwards last year, because, you know, Arthur Smith ain't about that. 11 personnel, um, you know, but I, I do think if, if Arthur Smith can find ways to get Scotty Miller, you know, uh, quote unquote, unlock Scotty Miller, I think that could really elevate this offense in a major way. So as I said, no real strong Josh Ali takes. I think if you're expecting him to go into the season, get 10, maybe up to 20 catches this year, I think he's more than capable of doing that. If you're expecting more than that, then, you know, he, he may leave you wanting, but that may not necessarily be a reflection of him. That just may be a reflection of how the Falcons play on offense. But we'll continue today's episode answering Rise Up's question from Discord. He says, hey, Aaron, make the case for Julio being a top five receiver of all time. I, gr I agree that he is. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't think a stats-based argument is particularly compelling, not, you know, not to – hate on the nerds or anything like that. I'm certainly a nerd in that regard, but it's not a compelling argument for most people. Now, if I was to throw a stat at you, it would be how much 
of an outlier in terms of explosive plays Julio was throughout his career that if you look at from 2011 to 2020 during his time here in Atlanta, you look at how many 20 plus yard plays he had, you know, the gap between him and who was number two during that span, Antonio Brown is the same as the gap between Antonio Brown was number eight. And if you condense, you narrow your focus to 2014 to 2019 when Julio was healthy and playing for the most part. And so injuries aren't, you know, shrinking that gap, the gap between him and number two uh, which I think is actually technically DeAndre Hopkins and Mike Evans tied for number two during that span, but is the same as the gap between number two and number 14. So that to me kind of illustrates what I think is the more compelling argument for Julio Jones being one of the greats of all time is that he was the most dominant and most feared wide receiver of the most previous decade, right? That basically teams came up with rules to try to stop him and he would consistently break those rules. And that's, a testament to his greatness. And one example of that is if you go back to the 2016 season, early that season, the Patriots played the Bengals and they had AJ green and AJ green cooked them on a couple of plays in this, in the first half. Uh, And then, so basically the the Patriots made a halftime adjustment and say, okay, none of our guys can single cover AJ green. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our biggest, most physical corner on him, Eric Rowe. He's going to press him, but he's going to have safety help over the top so that we're going to bracket AJ green the entire game. We're going to take him out of the game. And they were mostly effective of doing that. Um, and you know, they were able to roll in the second half of that game over the Patriots. And so when we got to the Super Bowl that year, they basically said we're gonna do that from the jump against Julio and hope we can stop him and hope we can contain him, I guess you could say. You can't stop him, you're gonna hope to contain him. And they did, I guess, technically contain Julio because he only had four catches, but every single catch he had in that game was like basically an explosive play. And we saw him at the end of that game make the catch that should have won the Falcons game. Of course, it didn't. Um, and so like that to me is what I mean when I say you put these rules out everything they put in their game plan was we got to stop that guy from beating us. And still Julio found a way to nearly beat the Patriots, even though he was being bracketed and doubled every single snap. And while my knowledge doesn't go back to like the primes of like Jerry Rice in the eighties, but at least going back to the last 30 years of seeing, being a football fan and seeing the primes of several other players, I don't know if any other player outside of maybe Randy Moss and, and, and Megatron would be put on that same level as these guys are going to break all the rules right um of being that sort of fearsome and and dangerous receiver and i know at least with randy moss he's widely considered to be one of the top two to three wide receivers in the nfl and i think julio is just as deserving as being at least in the top five conversation whether you want to put him in the top two or three is up to you but certainly in in the top five uh uh, up there so that that would be my case for why julio is a top five wide receiver but we will continue today's episode uh answering more listener questions including getting into my musical taste as well as playing an interesting game of uh, start bench cut with Jalen Mayfield, Vic Beasley and Peter Cons. And we'll get into all of that as we continue today's locked on Falcons. So buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. And with game time, it's the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guaranteed. You can stop stressing and start getting hype for all the fun you're going to have. I love game time um, because you can, you know, buy those last minute deals. Like I'm sitting here thinking about going to some Duke football games, given that I live in North Carolina, but I don't need to plan it out months in advance. I can just kind of wait and get those last minute deals. I can also get that seat view of what the event's going to look like for my seat. So if I want to sort of get that sort of fake all 22 view of watching Riley Leonard go through his progressions at the Duke football games. I can do that uh, based off of the game times app and they always will give you the best price guaranteed. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time will credit you 110% the difference. So snag tickets without stress by downloading game time, uh, create an account and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off download game time today, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So guys, once again, want to thank all my everydayers that submitted questions on today's episode. And if you're curious on how you can submit questions for future Q and A's, of course you can do so via Twitter at lockdown Falcons. You can send an email to lockdown Falcons at mail.com. You can leave a comment here on the lockdown Falcons, YouTube channel, as well as hit me up in the discord as so many people did uh, the link in the description below. So our next question comes from DeMarco Hellum Stan on the discord. He says, uh, you know, I, feel like we only ever ask Aaron about football. So here's a more fun question. What kind of music do you listen to? So I think my music tastes are pretty basic. You know, I, I listen to a lot of hip hop and R&B. If you go on my phone, you'll see a lot of Drake, Jay-Z, Nas, J. Cole, The Weeknd, Kendrick, 
uh, Rihanna, Beyonce, old Kanye, uh, not new Kanye, uh, Outkast, Boys to Men, T Pain, Usher, Mary J. Blige, all that and more. You go old school, you know, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, Luther Vandross. You know, if you go outside of that sort of hip hop, R and B, soul re- wheelhouse, um, you know, I like Ariana Grande. Um, as a '90s kid, I, I like uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, Lincoln Park, Coldplay. Um, I had a college roommate that was bought a Best of Journey album. Used to play that a bunch uh, during my junior year, and uh, so I'm, I'm weirdly into Journey as well. So you you get a couple of drinks in me and catch me at 2 a.m. at a bar and it faithfully comes on on the jukebox. I'm I'm going to embarrass myself singing at the top of my lungs. I also um, when I'm like writing or reading or or studying or something like that, listening to music with words tends to trip me up. Like, I, I don't know, it confuses the language centers in my brain or something like that. Uh, so I, I tend to like to listen to music without words. So like soundtrack and trailer music. So you also find a lot of Hans Zimmer, um, Thomas Bergerson from Two Steps from Hell also on my phone. So, you know, again, I think my music tastes probably pretty basic, but there it is. Uh, our last question, or maybe we'll see if we can get this through this quickly, but potentially comes from Bergantor on the Discord. He says, all right, Aaron, we commemorate the roster moves with a game of start one, bench one, cut one. Jalen Mayfield, Vic Beasy, Peter Cons, and let's say it's based on the current roster. So I'm starting Vic Beasy. That's easy. Benching and cutting one. I'm, I'll am i probably bench Peter Cons and cut Jalen Mayfield only because you threw in the caveat it's a current roster. I mean, Peter Cons is just as bad a fit, I think, or a worse a, a, a square peg in a round hole for our current scheme fit because I'm assuming current roster means current scheme and all that stuff. Um but just because I had a higher opinion of Peter Kahn's coming out of Wisconsin than I did Jalen Mayfield, you know, I, I'll take that on my bench over, you know, Jalen Mayfield. So um, if you didn't know, Jalen Mayfield did sign with the New York Giants practice squad today, I believe. And so he'll be able to go back and, and be less of a square peg playing in their gap heavy run scheme. And my hope for Giants and Jalen Mayfield is that they also move him back to guard so that he has a chance to at least improve enough in pass protection that he'll be serviceable and be a, a, a halfway decent backup in the league. So, you know, much, I know Jalen Mayfield <laughs> doesn't think this is sincere, but like, I, I do hope, you know, he, he gets an opportunity, a better opportunity in New York than he got here in Atlanta to, you know, turn his career around. But, you know, speaking of square pegs and round hole, let's, you know, this is a good opportunity for me to revisit another one of these uh, long standing issues I had, which was Vic Beasley, who I thought was also, kind of square pegged here in Atlanta because the Falcons and, and, you know, the Titans and Raiders also tried to turn him into this elite pass rusher. And it, that just was never going to work for him. Um, and I know everybody talks about, you know, not having the, the makeup and the, the, the desire and the character and all that stuff to be a football player. He didn't love football, all that stuff and more. And well, I certainly think that was a factor in why big PZ didn't work out in the NFL. I think it also ignores a very big part of why he didn't work out in the NFL, which is that he was physically not built to be an NFL player, right? That you don't look around the NFL and you see a lot of six two, 240 pound edges having a high degree of success. Now, you know, it's basically Robert Mathis over the last 20 years and, you know, maybe Nick Herbig uh, changes this. But, you know, I think Herbig is a good example of a player that while his primary rush is a speed rush or a fastball, you know, he's also building other things off of that uh, in addition to just relying solely on that, like we saw with Vic Beasley. And again, I know a lot of people point to why Vic Beasley didn't really develop additional moves due to lacking that quote unquote football character. But I also think, you know, it's part of human nature where he was never really incentivized to develop anything beyond a fastball because all his success at Clemson was basically just on fastballs and it led to him being a top 10 pick. And then he was pretty productive in his first two NFL seasons, just throwing fastballs. Uh, and so he was never really incentivized to develop a curve, develop a slider to develop a, a real pass rush repertoire. Now, again, why Vic Beasley didn't necessarily hone his fastball, I think it speaks to um, the questionable, you know, want to and desire and all that stuff. But I will continually die on this hill and think that the proper way to to get the way that the Falcons and other teams could have gotten more out of Vic Beasley was not trying to maximize his pass rushing ability, but to utilize him in the, in the way that we did in 2017, where you saw him play more of that off-ball linebacker role or Sam linebacker role, as well as what you saw in the back half of the 2019 season when Raheem Morris took over the defense and they were doing a lot more dropping him in the coverage 
than they were previously. And I, again, I know a lot of people are like, well, Vic Beasley was terrible in coverage. He was bad in zone coverage, right? Because he didn't have the reps and the experience and the awareness to play zone coverage, right? Um, but when it came to man coverage, Vic Beasley was fine, right? That's a testament to his athleticism. And it, it's a similar way that when we talked about Lorenzo Carter last year, uh, and why he was potentially valuable in a Dean P style defense, where if you're going to use a lot of simulated pressures, which the Falcons did under Raheem Morris and, and certainly under Dean P's, you know, that was the right way of utilizing Vic Beasley, where you could not only rush him, but also utilize him in, as space in space. And if the Falcons had, you know, sort of rather than trying to resurrect, you know, a fluke of a season as a pass rusher and just sort of being like, this is the best way to use you. And that's how we're going to use you. I think you would have seen Vic Beasley have more success. Now, again, is that type of player, the type of player that you would say is worth a top 10 pick? No, but you know, as we've seen with Lorenzo Carter, you see Tyus Bowser in Baltimore, you see Leonard Floyd, uh, you know, elsewhere, like those players can go on and be effective, productive and have viable NFL careers playing in that role, even if that role isn't necessarily worth a top 10 pick. And, and so again, that's why this is the hill I will die on when it comes um, to Vic Beasley. So that is it guys. I know uh, several other people s- submitted questions. Unfortunately, we will not get to those on today's episode, but uh, um, swing by the um, locked on Falcons discord link in the description below for Saturday. I believe we will do another symposium, which is basically a Twitter space. We do those, from like 3 p.m. and they usually last three to five hours depending on you know if i'm trying to do anything else on my saturdays <laughs> other than talk about the atlanta falcons and football but since we, i don't think we did one last week so uh, i'm sure there's still a lot of takes and opinions that need to be expressed so i think you know this is the last time we get to do it or second to last time because we, we'll probably do another one before week one next week but you know yeah, so this was the last. Yeah, so, so swing by. I don't know what I'm saying, guys. So come on by, swing by if you if you haven't already. If you you know, 3 p.m. Eastern time uh, is is the time to do that. But uh, that is going to do it for us here, guys. We'll be back on Monday to start pivoting towards this week one game, right? Uh, we'll also have some. We should have some guests on as well next week to talk about their expectations for why this Falcon team you know should be good and maybe some of their concerns all that and more. So uh, look forward to that. Continue to make us your first listen. And of course, for your second listen, why not check out the Locked On NFL uh, season preview, uh, the annual uh, season where you'll get to hear my takes as well as the other 31 teams hosts uh, breaking down this upcoming season to get you geared up for next week's action. So that's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network, guys. Your team every 